This program contains graphic content that may disturb some viewers. OK, up onto your feet, Lily Reid. The NDIS has transformed the lives of thousands of people living with disabilities. Here's the pansies that we planted last week. <laughs> Ready? It's also become a booming business with taxpayer funding of more than $40 billion this year. Criminals, opportunists and registered providers have been caught exploiting loopholes to overcharge and defraud the scheme. The NDIS is definitely being wrought. It requires fundamental surgery. Some of the most vulnerable people with disability are being used as cash cows, preyed on for their NDIS funding. These unscrupulous providers are like sharks that circle these people looking for who they can pick off. To my mind, that's abduction. The NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission is supposed to protect people living with disabilities. But it's failing the most vulnerable in the scheme. Three teeth was snapped at bone level. What do you think would have happened if Ashley had remained there? She would have died. Our investigation has uncovered shocking vision of children with autism and intellectual disabilities being restrained unlawfully. What came to light was a lot of very abusive practice. Very abusive practice on children. And how the NDIS Commission doesn't hold providers to account. So you said that you saw the footage? Um, what I saw was young people um, being subject to restrictive practices. There's absolutely no situation where a restraint like that can be used. This really is abuse. The NDIS did nothing. I'm just astounded that in Australia something like this could happen. Australia's groundbreaking initiative in disability is a saviour for countless families. Before the NDIS, I actually think they were some of the darkest days ever. That is almost a lost decade to me. I was probably on duty 23 hours a day. The NDIS has finally given Lily Reid the technology to express herself. My name is Lily. I am 18 years old. <gasps> Good work. I finished school last year. I was school captain. I have learnt who my daughter is. I can see what she likes. I can see what she doesn't like. My favourite thing is dancing. One, two, three. <laughs> Lily has an incredibly rare genetic syndrome called Pitt-Hopkins syndrome. It's changed the life of Lily's mother, Melissa, too. <laughs> the NDIS has meant that I can go to work and I can earn an income and give us a stability of life that we didn't have. Up we go into the chariot. Lily likes to go out and about. She joined a life-saving club. Morning, hi. Hi, hi Melissa. Hi. Hi, Lily. How are you going today? The scheme itself has enabled Lily to have equipment, like a walking frame, like a beautiful wheelchair, a accessible vehicle. 
And it means that Lily is actually accessing her community. She's being seen, she's being included. Most disabled people don't even know that they should have rights. People living with disabilities have fought hard for equality and inclusion over decades. When people with disability came out of institutions, funding was scarce. And so there were all these really horrific stories of people not having their everyday, very basic human rights met. That was really the, the turning point that led us to uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme to provide a consistent, reliable disability care system for all Australians. The Prime Minister has the call. Disability care starts in seven weeks' time and there will be no turning back. I commend this bill to the House. The National Disability Insurance Scheme gave people with disability their own funding to purchase support and services from a private market. The NDIS is a, is a revolutionary scheme. It's admired in many countries uh, around the world. And what it's done is shifted the balance of power so that people with disabilities, we now have the choice and control uh, of our lives and of the services that we receive. The NDIS has blown out, this year costing more than Medicare and projected to cost $90 billion a year within a decade. The number of people on the scheme has soared because the states have largely stopped funding services. Yeah, so look at this one. Too many shonky providers are offering respite accommodation. Three months ago, we launched a crowdsourced investigation asking people to tell us about their experience with the NDIS. This is from an insider saying service providers are stealing money from clients by conducting bookings in the portal without their knowledge, not providing the service but still taking the money. That seems to be a recurring theme. Mm. Yes. Hundreds of participants, their families and workers reached out. Yeah, we've got a few calls as well. Providers charging exorbitant amount of money, taking massive amounts of fees. Uh, the number one concern, um, overcharging and fraud. I've had two providers embezzle money from my fund, uh, which have not been investigated. Other way, round the door. Police search warrant! Go on. Police search warrant! Go, go, go! go. Headlines about NDIS fraud focus on organised crime. We've now got 44 criminal investigations underway. If they go with a plan manager... But our investigation found more money is being lost to legitimate providers. It's actually very easy to overcharge or put in an invoice that is... Uh, not legitimate. Colin Mullane helps people coordinate their plans. He tells us how providers can overcharge and defraud clients by sending invoices directly to the National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIA, which manages all payments. So the NDIS will just pay an invoice regardless of whether the work has been done? It will just get paid. Nobody is verifying that the actual work was done. Participants are unaware they're getting ripped off and the NDIA is, is forking out the money. It is unfortunately very easy to put in fraudulent claims because the NDIA systems don't require you to upload a receipt when you make a claim. And even if you do upload a receipt, there is no real system in the back end to check the validity of those receipts that you're uploading. 
The Auditor General has been warning the NDIA for years that these payment arrangements pose a high risk of fraud. And as recently as June this year said, the frequency and rigour of its assessment of fraud risks is insufficient. The NDIS is, is certainly bleeding money this way. We've been doing our own digging into just how much is being overclaimed by providers. So when the NDIA checks up on providers to see if they're overcharging or charging incorrectly, what do they find? So in June 2022, they identified tens of thousands of incorrect or non-compliant payments worth almost $44.8 million. Each year, the NDIA has to estimate how much it thinks it's losing because of errors and fraudulent activity. And in the last financial year, it was actually quite big. So the estimated potential financial impact of provider errors was $606 million. Wow. 606 from either errors or fraud by providers. That's right. It's quite a big figure. Yeah. Catch some fish to let her walk. Fingers crossed, mate. Fingers crossed. <laughs> mm. Jamie Colhane greets each new day with optimism. Makes me feel good. I love fishing. I've got two favourite hobbies that's betting on the horses and fishing. It's a massive change from where he was just 18 months ago, living in shocking conditions. It was like living in a hellhole, that place. People like Jamie are at the mercy of the NDIS providers. Jamie lived at Sydenham Grace, a supported residential service, a type of boarding house in Melbourne. The 56-year-old has schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and was living with 16 other people, many with psychosocial disabilities. Yeah, this is the place. Yep. The layout is like cells, one cell after another, all the way down the hallway. There was a big padlock on the door with a chain so thick massive, like you're locked in, like you're in prison. These are the conditions which Jamie and others were living in at Sydenham Grace and Grace Manor, another boarding house connected to the same owners. Both facilities were forced shut last year by the Victorian regulator, which found people were kept in uninhabitable living conditions had insufficient food and were subject to bullying, intimidation and abuse. How did you feel living there? Oh, shit. <laughs> it's a bad place to live. <laughs> I went through hell in that place. The boarding house wasn't an NDIS facility, but the owners did have two NDIS businesses. They signed up the majority of the residents in the house as their NDIS clients, including Jamie. This meant they could access some or all of their NDIS funding. Why do you think they were signing you up for the NDIS? Can I tell you why? I'll tell you why straight out, for this. That's all it's all about. Hi. Hello, is that Pavinda? 
Yes. Hello, Pavinda. My name's Anne Conley. I'm from the ABC. Just let me we know called Pavinda Kaur, one of the co-owners of Jamie's Boarding House. The complaint that we've had from people that have been signed up by you as the, their NDIS provider is that you're really only in it for the money. I would say I highly disagree with that. We provide more services. I would say sometimes even the funding is not there. We're doing above and beyond. Should you be an NDIS provider when you've had two facilities closed down by the state regulator because of the very poor conditions there? The proof, the, st the facilities closed down is for n number of reasons. It can be a personal vendetta. It can be any reason. But is there any proof which makes me ineligible to be uh, looking after the people who are disabled? The NDIS regulator, the Quality and Safeguards Commission, deregistered one of Ms Kaur's companies, which she's contesting, but it allowed her to remain an NDIS provider. Perfect. Thanks, Anne. You Thank you. Thanks, Pavinda. They're now free to set up new companies and go about their business of apparently looking after our most vulnerable people. It's disgraceful. Nobody should be treated like this. There are 4,000 people living in other boarding houses of this type in Victoria. 1,600 of them have NDIS packages worth $200 million a year. How attractive are they to unscrupulous providers then? Well, at $200 million, they are extremely attractive. Charlotte Jones has evidence that many of these residents have been lured to private accommodation by unscrupulous providers, sometimes taken in the dead of night. It is human trafficking. You're trafficking that person for the financial gain. You'll have somebody walking in saying, well, I have this house in this place and you can come and live there and we'll give you pizza every night and there'll be a flat screen TV and you can always choose what you watch and you'll have your own room and all of these other things to entice them to come with them. Anyone can be an NDIS provider, sign up participants and charge for services, even if they don't deliver them. When they're brought out here, they're removed from their communities, so they become really isolated. It's here in Melbourne's outer suburbs that providers are bringing people to live. A group of nurses have taken matters into their own hands and have been rescuing them. Linda Carafilli tells us about one in particular. I remember receiving a call from him absolutely desperate, saying, I'm scared to leave, I'm going to be homeless. There is so much money to be made from ripping off these clients. So are these people cash cows? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would... The way that these people are treated is like they are stock f for these operators. So the more stock they have, the more revenue, NDIS taxpayer revenue they're bringing in. So, yeah, absolutely cash cows. Linda and her fellow nurses have been warning NDIS regulators about this disturbing practice for five years. Their concerns were ignored. Myself and many of my colleagues have contacted the NDIS Commission, spent hours on the phone. We all are aware what is happening to people, the terrible circumstances that clients are in, but we just, we can't be heard. We're not having anyone take that on board and take any action. Tracy Mackey is the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commissioner. She's the regulator responsible for ensuring people with disabilities are safe from abuse and neglect. Do you know where all of those people are? We shouldn't know where all they are. We're not keeping tabs on, as I said, their individual decision making of where someone might choose to live. Um, that is absolutely part of their right. And in, in fact, um, at the forefront of what we do at the Commission is the rights of people with disability, making sure that we uphold and respect those rights. So how can you be sure they're safe 
If they have a disability, they might not have family, and they have a provider who's taking advantage of them. If they have a provider who's taking advantage of them, we would really encourage them to get in contact with us. And there are a range of ways that they can do that. Sorry to interrupt you, but these are people with psychosocial disabilities mm -hmm. who maybe not have access to a phone, don't know how to reach the Commission. Do you really expect that they're going to be making a complaint about the provider who is responsible for their welfare? So that's why we're so pleased to see the number of complaints increasing. Complaints are at a record high of 16,000 this year, up more than 40% on the previous year. I think in hindsight, the NDIS was rolled out too quickly. It would have been better had it proceeded at the original pace recommended by the Productivity Commission with plenty of time to do the trials, uh, to gather lessons learned, to potentially fine tune the scheme before it was scaled up to the full cohort of five to 600,000 participants. Hassan Noura was the head of strategy at the NDIA. He left early last year. He says safeguarding people with disability was left behind in the rush to get the NDIS up and running. The Quality and Safeguards Commission simply does not have the resources and the capacity to be able to properly safeguard the, the welfare, the safety of participants in the scheme. It was here in Budgiewoy on the New South Wales Central Coast that Adele Lester raised her family, including her only daughter, Ashley. Did you say hello to Bailey? Oh, hi, Bailey. You want Bailey to sing to you? I'll sing to you. Come on. <laughs> she was always happy. She liked going to school. We didn't know she had a disability, but we figured it out before the doctors. So she has cerebral palsy, severe intellectual delay, epilepsy, and autistic tendencies. When Ashley was in her early 20s, she moved into this group home with four other people with intellectual disabilities. The home is run by Lifestyle Solutions, one of the country's biggest NDIS providers, receiving $183 million last year in taxpayer funds. We see you. Lifestyle Solutions. Everyday disability support you can count on. In 2020, Adele says Lifestyle Solutions began calling her saying there were altercations between her daughter and other residents. What was the sense that you were getting from Lifestyle Solutions Management about what was happening? They, they were minor incidents. They were all Ashley's fault because of Ashley. She does make noises and her noises was irritating the other clients. It didn't really work well. There was five residents in the property, all with high needs, high behaviours. She... Amy Carroll was one of Ashley's support workers at the Lifestyle Solutions home. She says there were frequent assaults. So this is an incident report you filled out. What happened here? This was an incident where Ashley was physically assaulted by another resident. He had put her in a headlock and had bit her on the upper back and pulled her hair. It was very aggressive. And how often were these assaults happening in there? Two to three times a week, I'd say. In June 2021, an ambulance was called after an incident involving Ashley. She wasn't taken to hospital. Amy found her the next morning. She says her teeth were so loose they were falling out. I found her in bed, covered in blood, 
all up the side of her face and her mouth was bleeding. It was on the pillowcases and the sheets. I had to wait until eight o'clock to be able to call my team leader. And once I spoke with her, I said, Ashley needs to go to the hospital. And she said, no, Ashley's going to the day program. I ended up calling Adele and sent Adele some photos through of Ashley so we could get some immediate medical treatment for her. Ashley's mother didn't know about this incident until Amy informed her. Over the next five months, Ashley had three separate surgeries to have false teeth implanted. Can you tell me what Lifestyle Solutions told you had happened? I was told she was running to her room, which she can't run. She tripped over shoes that was on the ground and fell backwards. Um, and as she was falling backwards, her hands came up and she hit herself in the face. And broke her teeth? Three teeth was snapped at bone level and two teeth were loose. I don't really know what happened. I just know it couldn't possibly have been what they told me. The dentist told me that as well. Adele then discovered the previous attacks on Ashley were much more severe. She obtained reports and photos which showed a black eye, bruising and bites, including a bite on her face so deep it scarred. Her life was getting attacked probably for 18 months, two years. The most shocking to see, I think, was the bite on the cheek. She was in bed asleep and another resident went in and bit her on the face. But by bite, she bites on and doesn't let go. This is what gets me. <laughs> what was she thinking? No one was helping her. No one. You know, how, imagine living like that. And, and she couldn't tell anyone. She, she couldn't speak. She couldn't, couldn't let us know to think that we'd had this 10-year relationship and it was all a lie. They'd been hiding things from me. Adele had been agitating to have Ashley removed from the house and made a formal complaint to the NDIS Safeguards Commission. I sent them pictures and incident reports that I had and they said they'd investigate. The safeguarding actions were taken immediately um, and part of that included her moving to different accommodation. And following that, um, there was also a range of um, compliance actions. What were the compliance actions taken with them? There was work done with them around the requirements around their workforce. Um, there was work done with them around um, meeting certain um, compliance elements, so areas of non-compliance. But what sort of penalty? There are circumstances in which you would issue a penalty, a penalty infringement notices. But um, you didn't in this situation? A penalty infringement notice wasn't one of the um, levers that the delegates at the time decided to utilise. In a statement to Four Corners, Lifestyle Solutions said it worked with Adele to obtain supports better suited to Ashley's needs and said it shared its deepest empathy for the distress this situation has caused. Well, you know, who cares? No one cares. Like, Lifestyle didn't care. NDIs didn't seem to care. No one cared. What do you think would have happened if Ashley had remained there? She would have died, I'm sure. She would have died. Big step. Good girl. You want to go and see the ducks? Mm. No. Mm. Poor ducks. A lot of these people in the group homes don't have parents. 
It's, you know, there's got to be more accountability. You look very pretty. You got your butterflies in. But they've got to monitor them. Put all your engines together. Oh, good. I'll only check this one, this big battery. This big giant battery. Yep, that one's that was good. Yeah. One Both of the fastest the growing street. groups of people battery. on the NDIS is children with autism. Jaden's just the most incredible young man. Same. Oh, no. He fills everyone's heart with joy. Everyone falls in love with him. 17-year-old Jaden Chard is happiest when he's surrounded by people who love and care for him. Because you are the best at building big, long trains. Absolute best. He just has an infectious personality. Mom, can I play Blues Rides and Four now? I reckon you've done amazing, mate. Jaden has an intellectual disability, autism and ADHD. All right, you ready? Ready. His disabilities sometimes present as behaviours of concern. Whoa. And in early adolescence, those behaviours became more frequent and severe. Whoa, good shot, Jay. <clears throat> Petra, a single mum of three, was desperate for help. My kids and I, our lives were ruled by Jaden. Everything we do every day was ruled by Jaden. His demands in our household were number one. You know, what Jaden says went. Jaden was referred to Irabina Autism Services in Melbourne, promoting itself as the biggest paediatric autism provider in Australia. It ran a course for children called the Severe Behaviour Program, based on its own version of a contested therapy called Applied Behaviour Analysis, or ABA. I've had parents tell me that they felt like we have saved their life quite literally, or we have Irabina had imported the program from a US autism centre and had even brought three of its therapists over. You are desperate. And when someone says, we've got a solution and we can change your lives, we will make your lives different, well, of course you jump at it. Well, look, he's coming out. ABA therapy varies, but it essentially aims to reduce behaviours of concern through repetitive exercises. In 2020, when Jaden was 14, he was signed up to attend the program, six hours a day, five days a week. The year-long treatment was paid for by the NDIS. How much did it cost? It was over half a million dollars. I mean, they've given you this enormous amount of money for this program. Why wouldn't you believe in it? Why would you think that it's not right? Jaden had most of his therapy at Irabina before his treatment moved to the family home. Petra saw Jaden being asked to comply with instructions over and over again. She was alarmed and decided to film it. So they would ask him to follow an instruction and if he refused, they would force him to follow that instruction. So, for example, if they asked him to brush his teeth and he refused, they would continue to deliver that exact same instruction for anything up to a couple of hours until they forced him to brush his teeth. Sitting in the centre of the room. No! Five seconds. Five. Yep. 
to the center of the room and I'm in here. Five, four, three, two, one. They would just repeat over and over to move into the centre of the room or we will move you. And if he didn't move, they would physically move him, even if he was shouting and screaming at them to stop and they wouldn't stop. Ben, you're not keeping your calm hand and cool body. Ben, you're moving to the centre of the room or the teacher will move you. Five, four, three, two, one. Here, the therapists want Jaden to sit on a cushion. It was so disgraceful and so horrific and so traumatic and so wrong. Like through the entire program, I would go to them with my concerns and I would end up in the CEO's office being convinced that I was the one that was wrong. Now an insider is blowing the whistle publicly on what happened at Irabina Autism Services. Melissa Webster was the Chief Operating Officer. Why have you decided to speak out today? I'm doing it because I'm doing it for the human rights of the people that deserve a great life. What came to light was a lot of very abusive practice, very abusive practice on children. There were children that were um, held down, children that were um, secluded and restrained really significantly. It wasn't until later that I found out that we're not actually um, practices that are legal here in, in, in um, Australia or Victoria. Hi everyone. With so much happening in our world at the moment, I wanted to send this out to give you all something to smile about. We have the CEO at the time, Deborah Goldfinch, established the program at Irabina. Her daughter, who had no previous experience in disability, managed the program and was responsible for the children's human rights. Irabina's treatment involved physical restraints and by law had to be approved by a state office called the Victorian Senior Practitioner. That office told Irabina it couldn't use some of those restraints because they're prohibited in Australia. Irabina went ahead anyway. There were so many people that came forward afterwards. They, they raised concerns, they raised complaints. They said they didn't agree with the program, they didn't agree with what they were seeing, but they didn't feel heard. Some other people have told us that um, they weren't allowed in that section where that program was happening, mm. that it was quite hidden. Yeah. What would you say about that? It's true. It's true. After months of research and contact with former workers from Irabina, we've now obtained CCTV footage from inside the Severe Behaviour Program. We now know children had treatment in one of six small windowless rooms with one-way mirrors for observation. 18 children, including Jade and Chard, attended. There were both boys and girls, and we're told most of them were aged between 10 and 14. In this video, staff in protective gear have been called to one of the padded rooms where children spent hours each day. When there was a so-called uncontrolled behaviour, workers called each other for backup on walkie-talkies. A warning, what you're about to see is extremely disturbing. <laughs> This boy has a severe intellectual disability, autism, and is nonverbal. Oh, 
We need to be calm for five minutes. That means not hurting us or yourself. Five minutes. The boy is told he must be calm for five minutes and then he will get some pain medication. Five minutes, we can get some nerfing. He lasts three and a half minutes. Six workers keep him pinned to the ground for just over seven minutes. When he's finally released, he's encouraged to high-five one of them. I think that the whole environment um, is, you know, to me, seems to be enormously intimidating. To me, it's just this whole scenario is unacceptable. Our researcher Jess asked for an expert opinion from Dr Frank Lambrick, the former Victorian senior practitioner. Well, it's a prone restraint. It's a prohibited restraint. There's absolutely no um, situation where a restraint like that can be used. Prone restraint is probably the most riskiest of the prohibited restraints, if I could say that, because it uh, involves forcing a person to, um, to lie face down, um, therefore putting um, pressure on internal organs, etc. I'm finding it very hard to watch this, actually. It's uh, not lawful. This really is abuse. An independent review from 2021 and obtained by Four Corners found that using this prohibited restraint with an intellectually disabled child when the child was in crisis is inconsistent with the right to humane treatment under Victoria's Human Rights Charter. The review was told other types of prohibited restraints were also used on other children at Erebina. What's your understanding of what happened at Irabina Autism Services? They were a service provider that um, particularly used um, quite, um, uh, particularly su provided supports um, to participants with really complex and often um, quite challenging um, behaviours. And so um, they had a particular approach. Um, that approach had been in place for some time. And when we became aware of what was happening there in terms of their approach, there was immediate action taken to cease um, a number of elements um, of their practice. Did you or anybody from the Commission see the footage of children being restrained? I've seen some of the footage and um, it is deeply concerning and that's why staff took action immediately um, to make sure that participants were safe and the practice ceased. At the time of this interview, Four Corners had not seen the footage. I've been told that it shows therapists wearing gridiron-style gear, holding children down. As I've said, it's deeply concerning and not something that should be tolerated. The NDIS Commission says it closed down the Severe Behaviour Program in 2021. It ordered staff to undertake training, but didn't fine or deregister Irabina. 
We've seen so many families come through our centre. It also didn't take any action against the then CEO Deborah Goldfinch or her daughter. Deborah Goldfinch now heads another autism service for young children. It's actually going to be bigger, brighter, shinier. The regulation says you'll apply the strongest actions to the most serious issues and breaches. This is a human rights breach and you decided that they didn't deserve a fine, that you would just create some compliance action. Why not take more serious action against them? There are a range of actions that we can take with any provider and shutting down that particular service and ensuring that that program was not operating anymore um, was the decision that the Commission made at that time. Ms Goldfinch and her daughter told Four Corners through their lawyers that they were employed in non-clinical roles at Irabina. They added that at all times programs were conducted with the full knowledge, endorsement, oversight, supervision and funding support of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The NDIS, they should have known. They should never have allowed it to happen. Yet it went for two and a half years. I'm just astounded that in Australia something like this could happen. It was Melissa Webster who alerted the NDIS Commission to the prohibited practices at Irabina. If you hadn't blown the whistle, do you think this program would be continuing right now? I do think that if I hadn't have raised these concerns and hadn't have done the investigation and gone out and asked for an external investigation and reached out to all of the regulators, I think that probably would have done. It did for so long. In a statement, Irabina said that its intention was always to provide the highest level of care, and it truly regrets if it did not meet this objective and any distress has been caused. Welcome to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. We are currently experiencing a high volume of calls. <laughs> Pete Richard has had to resort to lodging freedom of information requests with the NDIS Commission because she and other families are still in the dark about what happened at Irabina. Good boy. Why is it? Good, good boy. You and Ryder used to do slides together when you were younger. Come on. Come on, Ryder. Round here. Come back. This way. They have a duty of care to all the children that went through that program. And they still haven't investigated. And the families and the children that were there have, have never been informed of what's happened. NDIS Minister Bill Shorten declined our invitation for an interview. He didn't answer specific questions about Irabina, but said, if you are using cruel and illegal restricted practices, you do not belong in the scheme. He added that his expectations of the Commission and its leadership are extremely high. Ashy, go and get the blue pipe for me so I can over here, the blue one. Findings from two national inquiries into disability are about to be released. The Royal Commission and the year-long mm. review into the NDIS. We'll go to the shops on the way back to your house. Mm. Our investigation shows that despite billions of dollars being pumped into the system, people with disabilities have been abused in Australia. And no one is paying the price for that. The Quality and Safeguards Commission must be responsive to allegations of abuse and neglect. It's unacceptable if complaints are being received that are not resulting in appropriate action being taken. They have to hold the practitioners accountable. They have to hold the CEO accountable. They have to hold the board of directors accountable. And then they have to show the community 
that they've held everyone accountable so that other providers see that when you don't do what's right, when you abuse our most vulnerable in the community, that you don't get away with it.